Okay. Welcome to this evening's school board meeting on Tuesday, September 8th. Welcome back from summer, and I hope you all had a fabulous first day of school today. I invite you to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item number one on our tonight's agenda is to ask if there are any adjustments to tonight's agenda. Anyone? Okay, moving on. Item number two, approval of school board minutes. Actually, I do have an adjustment to tonight's agenda. Do we have under communications? Um, Maybe item, the new item A should be uh, student reports, so we can hear from our new student representatives. It's, it's item three. three. They have their own very item. Never mind. Moving on. Item number two, sorry. Okay. Approval of school board minutes. May I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve uh, the school board minutes uh, as listed in the agenda packet, item 2A, B, and C. A second. Discussion? Updates, corrections? All those in favor? Okay, on to item three. Comments by the student representatives. Okay, so today was our first day of school. Um, and so we're both seniors, and it's kind of, it's good to be back. Um, it's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have like a nice long, nice long break. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's not a ton going on right now because we literally just got back today. Um, but I think one thing worth mentioning was that we have, we have a Fresh Links program. So we're juniors and seniors um, are assigned to a couple freshmen each. And you kind of will show them around the first day, give them a tour of the high school. Um, and so we really like revamped that this year because in the past couple of years it wasn't really doing much. Like the seniors would just like kind of bring their freshmen around the high school and have lunch with them and then never really talk to them again. Um, so we revamped it a lot this year. Um, so a lot of kids, I know Montana and I were both fresh links and so um, we each got assigned to two or three freshmen and we, we brought, them, brought them around the high school. Um, we had lunch with them. We did a couple activities where we would, um, that kind of involved the teachers and finding specific places around the high school that were of interest. Um, and so that was really successful. We ended up spending like three and a half hours just showing them around today. Um, so that was really good. Um, and that's something that I think is gonna be a lot more helpful with you know, actually getting the freshmen integrated into the building. Um, because we have a lot more planned activities with Fresh Links than we did last year. Um, so I think that's, that's gonna help a lot for the freshmen to know that um, we're just gonna keep seeing them and it's not just like a first day and then done thing. Um, so yeah, that's the first. That's so not to put you on the spot, but what are some of the planned activities, or are they a surprise? Uh, no, they're, they're not a surprise. Um, the first one that comes to mind is, I think it's called Free Cookie Day, where it's, it happens in like what late day? September, where we just all meet up with our fresh links, and then we give them a, cook, a ticket for a free cookie in the cafeteria. Um, I know there's an ice cream social at some point. Um, we're trying to plan like a tailgating party during one of the home football games in late September, um, where we'll all just go with our fresh links um, and hang out and do tailgating. Um, I think we're doing like an end of the semester, pre-midterm um, get together. Um, and then I think we have like scheduled weekly check-ins with the advisory where we have like probably six or seven seniors and then 10 or 12 freshmen. Um, and we all have, and we have an advisory teacher for that, and we'll all just get together. And that's like we have those scheduled for the next couple of weeks, um, so that we don't just like slack off and not see our freshmen. So, yeah. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah. Montana, welcome aboard. Thank you. It's nice to see a fresh nice face. To see you too. Um, so, um, adding on to what Natalie said earlier about the Fresh Links program, another. Um, like meetup we have planned in the next couple of weeks is I believe we're trying to organize some type of thing to
to encourage class unity, whether it's wearing all the freshmen wear white on one day. We had talked about doing t-shirts as well, like that said, I survived the first month of high school, but we might not be doing that just because not everyone might not wear it and whatnot. And in terms of like athletics are kicking up this week, as most of you probably will know, um, our first home football game is this week. And so I think one of the things that's going to be big in the next few weeks is our class coming together and rooting for all the teams that have games. So. And is there an awesome game coming up in the next 24 hours, maybe? There is. Cape was with girls soccer plays York tomorrow evening it's our first at home 5 o'clock. If any of you like to come. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, item number four, comments from the public on agenda items? Any comments? If you could just please state your name. Good evening. My name is Bill Gross. Uh, I've got a comment on the uh, item 5A on the uh, agenda. It's the smarter balance uh, test results. And I went, to the, uh, I went to the attachment and I looked at it and I looked at the eighth grade math scores. And I was kind of shocked when I saw that. It, it, this says that 56% of our eighth graders did not meet any of the math standards uh, set by the, the test. And 20% of the eighth graders met some of the math standards but didn't meet all of them. And only 24% of the eighth graders actually met all the math standards or exceeded them. And this seemed kind of shocking to me, so I'm hoping that when the school board gets to this item tonight, they can spend a little bit of time, because I've got three questions. Number one, is this really as bad as it seems to me? Maybe I'm misinterpreting uh, the data, and it's not really as serious as it seems. But it seems to me, as I recall from last year, the scores were much higher for the eighth graders in math. And the second uh, point I'd like you to take up is, what's the, what caused this dramatic drop, if it indeed is a dramatic drop in the scores? And number three, what sort of plans do the school board have to remedy this and uh, improve these scores next year? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gross. Hello, I'm Jen Brickley, and I live on Two Lights Road. And I apologize if I'm here at the wrong time because you said for agenda items. Um, but I don't want to miss my opportunity to have public comment. Um, and I understand that my following comments are not on the agenda this evening, but it is an issue of concern as we start the new year. Last spring at a school board meeting, parents and district staff filled the room in disapproval and concern about the full-time special ed director position being cut to a part-time position. Many of those parents expressed their concern to the school board and emphasized the need for a full-time special ed director. The board heard our concerns and a hiring committee was formed to help select the next full-time special ed director. The superintendent recently announced that an interim director had been hired, and to my knowledge, the position is part-time and was chosen without input from the hiring committee. I find that decision disconcerting with the global issues about our special ed program as brought up at last year's budget meetings. I would like to know how that decision was made and why the interview committee was not included in that process. I would also like to know what the timeline and process will be to hire the full-time special ed director as approved by the school board. If discussion cannot be approved for the questions that, that I have this evening, I'd like to request that it be addressed at a near future board meeting for public knowledge. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Cindy Voltz from uh, Philip Road. And my comments are also related to special education. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do, though, Meredith, is thank you. We have um, reserved a meeting space for our special education parents group at the middle school. And we'll be meeting monthly on the third Tuesday of each month um, as a group. And we're really seeing this as an opportunity to reach out to more parents and to kind of improve that communication with the schools and um, parents in, regarding special education. Um, I, too, like Jen, was frustrated by um, kind of not being involved. And I was a member of the interview committee for special ed director. It was frustrating to me to find out in the general announcement that an interim had been appointed. And also, um, then later learning that I believe that interim will be a part-time person. Um, we also found out today 
um, after my son started school of some changes to the way the ed tech services are being delivered. So I feel like the issues around communication that we raised last spring and we're hopeful we're making progress on um, still exist and we continue to have those concerns. But um, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to work more collaboratively this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Audra Welton and I live at 215 Two Lights Road. And I, um, too, have concerns in terms of the communication regarding special ed and the, you know, the oversight and the umbrella of it. Um, and that issue is, is new knowledge to me. I didn't realize that somebody had been hired in interim and part-time. But I also want to say that um, Zeb started fourth grade today and was delighted and there are seven teachers, and I'm so thankful. And I also, my older son, Evan, started high school today, freshman, and he was nervous, and he loved his day. He loved it. And he said, I had read an email in advance, which kind of explained about his day, and that made it fabulous for his transition. And he um, felt like everybody was very welcoming, not just his, the people who were helping him through the hall. So thank you for that. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Voltz. I'm at 33 Phillip Road. And I have a, a brief question actually on item four on communications. It's actually following up from the previous meeting. The previous meeting we discussed the survey, well, the, the survey was presented. And at the time, the discussion was, well, we've just received it. And there was really no discussion of it. And I was, one, I was somewhat disappointed to see that there was no discussion of that planned at the next meeting. And I'd like to know when that discussion is planned, as there were some items that uh, indicated there were areas of immediate concern. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further comments from the public, I'm on to item number five, communications. Mary? Actually, uh, Director Instruction Ruth Ellen Brown is going to give an overview of the Smarter Balance. Thank you. Oops. You have in your board packets the summary of our results. And Um, looking at our data for Smarter Balance, when we look at any given assessment, we look at what's being tested, who is being tested, how it's being administered, how those assessments correlate to other assessments and their results and what past data points offer comparison. For Smarter Balanced, to put things in context, this was the what was very similar. And WEA, STAR, and NECAP are all based on the Common Core standards, as was Smarter Balanced. We do have cohorts who have tested on the Common Core standards uh, for grades 4 through 8. Students in grades 3 and 11 were not tested on those standards in the same format last year, or none of them were in exactly the same format. Um, it is an electronic format, and WA and STAR are both electronic. We have no past data to correlate with this. This was a benchmark year. This was the first year the tests have been given. The test was new. We have no previous data for immediate comparison. While the standards are the same as NECAP and NWA and STAR, um, the reporting framework is not the same. And the test items themselves were of a different depth of knowledge that was being assessed. It was a different format than students had seen previously. So we don't have an apples to apples comparison for the analysis. Our summary report is, is here, and I apologize, it's very small. This will be posted on our website. 
Um, as has been pointed out, our scores, for the most part, with the exception of grade eight, were above the state average. However, they aren't terribly high. We were warned as curriculum coordinators across the state to expect that scores would look different than we had seen because of the differences in the test. Um, there are some points, particularly to grade eight, that I will mention in just a moment. They may or may not answer some of your concerns. Um, as we look at the performance levels for, this is for ELA, English Language Arts, I have another for math. The intervals that say this is an exceeds, this is a meets, this nearly meets or does not meet the standard, are not equal intervals for this test. And so for us to say, okay, well, the students scored here, and so we predict that an increase of this many points will put them in this category, we don't have that because of the shift in the intervals. Also, the fact that we have a very large confidence interval that's given. Typically, when a student is scored, let's say it's scored from 1 to 10, if the student receives a 7, the range would probably be given as between 6 and 8 were the student to score again, we would expect the score to fall in that range. Intervals for this test are, that's fairly small, uh, upwards of 30 in many instances, this shows a confidence interval of plus or minus 49. So as we look at the scores, it's very difficult to tell exactly where a student might fall were this to be given again, and it's not being given again because it was announced before the eighth grade had finished testing that the state would not be testing. Yes? Can you just clarify when you say a confidence interval of plus or minus 49, can you give us a concrete example of what that is? Yes. So, for instance, if a student scored this is uh, 2,445, plus or minus 49. So if that student were to test again, there may be 49 more points on the score or 49 fewer, somewhere in that range. So if but we were to place them in a in position a, or, or substantially below. below, within that range. So again, it's very difficult to place where they might be again. As we looked at the eighth grade scores, we had a number of students, both for middle school and for high school, who opted out of the test, or their parents opted them out. Students who were not opted out did have the undercurrents of, my friend is not taking the test, but I'm taking the test. That did skew some motivation in some areas. Um, and then for the eighth grade, they were in the process of finishing the test. We had three days left, and the state made its announcement that they were discontinuing Smarter Balance and would not be using it next year. But I still had this number of students who needed to finish testing. That did not help motivation a great deal. Um, in fact, it undermined it pretty well. So as we look at our results, Context is tough to give here. There are some overarching trends that we can look at with some of the areas that were not as strong, but I do not have released items as we've had in the past with NECAP. I do not have a disaggregated report that tells me a student, here I have three categories. One says concepts and procedures, one says problem solving and modeling and data analysis, and one says communicating um, reasoning. But I don't have what types of questions around communicating reasoning that student had difficulty with. I don't know if it were the performance task. I don't know if it were some of the extended written questions. I don't know if it was multiple choice. I don't know. I don't have that data. And so for me to tell you that this is exactly what is or isn't happening within a particular program based on these results, that's very difficult. I will say that as we look at our data 
using STAR, using NWEA, that are based on the same standards, we've seen fairly consistent trends with a little bit of an upswing. This really doesn't match any of that. And next year, whatever tests we have for state testing, we will be back in a benchmarking year. And again, it will not count toward our state report card. Our district report card is on the website currently. It does not include smarter balance data. Our state re dis district report card from the state for no child left behind reporting is based on our 13-14 kneecap and will be again next year because whatever test the state gives us will be in another benchmarking year. So we are held in limbo as far as state reporting is concerned. Yes. Just to reiterate um, and address the sort of the concerns that were raised. So it, I hear you, I'm hearing you correctly, according to the NWEA of the kneecaps and the STAR, the eighth grade performance on their math scores is not as dire as this reflects, <laughs> correct. Okay, so it, I would say that the eighth grade data is consistent with the other classes, so it does not show the drastic tail off that it does in this test. So consistent with other classes as in grade seven, grade six, or other grade eights before them, which other class? I would say both. Okay. Um, and one other piece to this too, the way that kneecap was done, because it was paper pencil, if a student finished, closed the booklet, put it down and just started, say, uh-uh-uh, go back, you're not done, go back and check that, go back and do some more work. The way that Smarter Balanced is designed is that as soon as a student hits submit, it's done. We can't call it back. They finish the test, it's completed. And so, for instance, this first student here who had an achievement of level one, I've taken off any of the identifying data, but I did look to see who before I put things here. I watched this student test, and I had a faculty member comment to me before the student went in, that's one of our better math students. This should be a good test. The student took the test in three minutes flat. Is this representative of his best work? Probably not. We had a number of students who took the test almost as quickly. Not all. And there were some who really did an outstanding job on the test. But we had a number who were there and not terribly invested in the results. Any other questions? One quick one. Sure. Um, can I, since this, since Smarter Balance was given across the country. Yes. Can I assume the cut points were nationally standard based and nothing from the state of Maine impacted cut points on this? Result? Cut point, by cut points I mean what means proficient, what's partially right. proficient and so forth. In, in I, times, what we have done it ourselves as a state, we pulled teachers together and set those mm -hmm. marks. And I'm guessing we didn't have anything to say about this one, right? I can't answer that with any confidence. Mm -hmm. I know that even with NECAP, even though it was given regionally, each state within the consortium set its own cut points. So... It was my understanding that that was me. Plan was to establish its own cut points. It was part of the reason that the data was held mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. August. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we don't know who is who literally established those. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. And just and just a, and just a comment. I appreciate very much what you're saying about having other data points to look at. That's the whole point. As we look at student achievement, you don't. You can't over rely on. I, I, for one, really like getting standardized test data back to compare to the NEA was and the STAR, or what teachers Absolutely. say. But to get results back that give you no diagnostics, that don't give you released items, that don't allow you to really drill in and see what was causing error patterns, is pretty worthless. So I'm, I'm. 
it I was don't know where we're going, but this one isn't floating my boat. <laughs> it, it was six weeks. We, or at least not, students didn't spend six weeks with it individually, but I spent six weeks with yeah, the test. <laughs> Um, so what can we do as a school, board, a school board representing students and parents um, for the state? What message can we advocate? What message can we give to you, empowering the superintendent, um, writing letters, that this was an exercise that was not very helpful and took time away from? I think the state has heard that. I think that's probably a big part of the reason why we are not looking at smarter balance next year. Unfortunately, the timing of that decision made it difficult to pull things back and say, okay, well, um, I don't know for sure what test will be used moving forward. It would be, I know the discussion has been that it is more likely to be a test that is more familiar to us but I don't know for sure what that will be. Yeah, and I guess I would add, Kate, in response to your question, that it's helpful for school board members to continue to meet with their legislative representatives mm -hmm. and continue to learn about and educate them about educational issues. And as they represent the communities on the education committee in the legislature, the more information they have directly from school districts, the better prepared they are to advocate for school district needs. So that would be my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> just so we understand so uh, this test was get assessment was given it's the only time it'll be given so there it's after we review it tonight uh, hopefully we'll have more data for Ruth Allen to go through and glean uh, ideas from it but uh, this year it'll be a different assessment we still don't know what type of assessment and there won't be any comparable data for another year so it may be three years from now then we'll have two years of data but there's no guarantee the state won't mandate a different assessment. Um, yes. So one question is, if we have, if the state says, here's another assessment you're going to do this year, um, you know, one, are we obligated? Uh, you know, if it requires more resources, you know, how do we get comfortable that it's worth, you know, teacher time and administrator time doing it versus just saying, well, you know, waiting another year? In other words, how do we get comfortable that that should be a priority for our district? count your federal funds and you make a decision whether or not the value of those federal funds is worth the time and effort spent. As a district, we receive roughly half a million dollars in federal funds um, directly under our entitlement grants, both in special education, Title IIA, and Title I. And that essentially is the- And Title II D as well through the MILTI program. Uh, correct. Not, sorry. Thank you. Not to include MILTI, so that's mm -hmm. significant additional resources. And just in terms of timeline, at some point, you know, the school year just started today, but we'll be notified of some type of assessment that we'll have to do by year end. Is we that expect yes. so, and we expect that we will receive timelines for that. To date, we don't have that information. Last year, timelines were firmed up around January. I'm not anticipating hearing much before then, but it could happen. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions for Ruth on? I just want to make sure I understand this. Is it just the eighth grade testing that was disrupted by the state announcing what it announced? It, it was the eighth grade and the end of seventh grade, I believe, that was disrupted. I think the eighth graders had a little bit more ear to the ground as far as what was happening politically, perhaps. Um, because they were the last school to be finishing with their testing. But as far as the number of opt-outs, the high school was much more profoundly affected there. We only had 44 students test out of about 150 or so. So that certainly doesn't give us a complete picture there either. So um, if I can be simple, so you're basically telling us not to take this as a adequate guide to the quality of our uh, students in these grades for ELA or math because of a variety of reasons. One, the state interrupted it. Two, I assume it wasn't a very good test. 
three i mean should we just not pay attention to it i think there were parts of it that had potential to be very instructive what we have here is not that yes well the, the thing that slightly concerns me is when you look to us to the mean scale store score for the state which i assume is roughly around the average for the state, we're below it. So if everybody got disrupted in state, why is Cape below the average? I mean, everybody should have got disrupted at the same rate. Well, not, we had a 16 week test window for the state. And so not everyone was still testing at the point that announcement was made. I, I guess my point is, I, yes. I, I, I know you and I think your, your depth of knowledge is far excessive, in, in excess of mine about the validity of these tests. I guess what concerns me is I would have thought, however bad this test was, that might mean why we would do not very well against a relative objective standard, but when we do poorly or not superior to the rest of the state of Maine is kind of somewhat disturbing to me. I would agree. Uh, I certainly am looking forward to doing the STAR testing in the fall, which should be within the next couple of weeks at the middle school. We will have another set of data points, if not by our next meeting, by the October meeting, which I would be more than happy to share with you by comparison. Uh, we would have two years worth of data there to be able to say, here's our trend, here's where the students are against the same standards. It is not the same test. And so it's not truly an apples to apples to compare it to this, but it would give another data point. And if it shows that that cohort of students is doing very poorly, then we will certainly readdress. Yeah. I, I would just add, too, I think a really important litmus will be Jeff's ninth grade math teachers and physics teachers. And if they really see that there is a major issue compared to previous cohort groups. I would, I would rely on that as much as anything at this point. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or comments for Ruth Ellen Ballin on Smart Balance? Thank you so much. On to item 5B, the summer program, Open Doors Studios. We have some other pieces first, but coming up are Lisa Melanson, who's a high school teacher who worked with um, our high school age students this year, and joining her sooner or later will be John Holdridge, um, who also <laughs> worked with our summer program. Okay. Uh, he's the paper pass. This summer's program, we saw a few changes. We had about 70 students, give or take. Um, some days it was a little higher, some days it was a little bit lower. We, did, we were able to add high school to the mix this year. And um, I do not, again, I don't have the retention data for you at this point, but we'll have by the next meeting for us to see any type of effect that we had. But I think the student involvement is probably a much better litmus test for the effect of the program. So, so. All right, what you did? And I have the, I I'll have say the, the final, final. Yes. yes. Okay. okay, great. Hello everyone, again I'm Lisa Melanson. I'm a high school English teacher and I also work in the Achievement Center during the day. And this summer, I taught in the Open Doors Studio program. It was the second year of uh, this program, but the first year that there was going to be a course for high school students as well. Thanks, so my class was uh, grades, uh, included students from grades 9, 10, and 11. Um, so I saw the job posting in mid-March, and I was intrigued. So I inquired, and I was told I would be co-teaching with a math teacher. Uh, but it was sort of like a blind date. I didn't meet that teacher until the first day of professional de development, and she happened to be a graduate of CAPE uh, 1997, uh, Melissa Fowler Steffen, and she was in transit from Oklahoma to Oregon, and she stopped here for the summer uh, to teach in the program. 
think the essential part of the success in my mind was that we had three days of professional development uh, that was facilitated by John Holdridge and Jamie Clucci. Clucci. And um, the other teachers uh, from Pond Cove and the middle school, um, from those grades, we all got together. And I think one of the first directives was to go out and explore our environment. And uh, with that, we went outside and walked around. And Melissa and I walked through the marsh and the green belt and up to the swap shop. And it was sort of a eureka moment when we saw the swap shop and we said, wow, we could use this. Uh, so, um, oh, I forgot, the other directive we had was to create a project. So it's um, project-based learning. And that project design would unfold over four weeks of the program. So by the end of the three days of professional development, we had a plan for that project and how it would be uh, cross-curricular for, for um, hitting uh, English skills and math skills. And I think the, the program was sort of billed to students as not, not your typical summer school, uh, where it would be tedious with uh, perhaps worksheets and tests and, and cramming of a full semester into four or five weeks. Uh, there wouldn't be any tests. Uh, we tried to avoid worksheets. And it would be uh, a more um, stress-free stress and hands-on learning environment. Um, so that, that was uh, what we were working with. And I think, I think it worked pretty well. So before I get to what we did, well, when we had that eureka moment, sorry, in the uh, swap shop, my co-teacher, Melissa, said we could build a Rube Goldberg contraption uh, with all this stuff. And we knew it would be easy to get there. It wouldn't be expensive uh, to get to the swap shop. We wouldn't even have to buy any materials. Uh, so it was um, kind of be fun. It would just be fun to see what we could repurpose. Okay, so let me see if I can get this started. I think it's just uh, connecting right now. In your hands, uh, John Holdrich passed out a newsletter that we created from our four-week experience. So the day was um, about 45 minutes of writing to begin the class each day. It was a three-hour class. And there would be free writing time followed by focused writing that had to do with um, the math and physics of our contraption. And then uh, we'd have a little break, maybe a two, three-minute break. And then we would, um, perhaps one day of the week, we would have a field trip for an hour to the swap shop. Um, then we'd be uh, sorting the materials, disassembling, uh, and then the trial and error process of seeing how we could build a machine. So, um, let's see if I can get this going now. Okay. Okay. So here we are. Uh, I think it was the second or third day of uh, the class. Um, a couple of the students. I found that uh, over the course of the four weeks, I started, I don't, I don't think I've ever thought this way, but starting to think in terms of physics, in terms of levers, and in terms of pulleys and um, acceleration and, and the um, mass required to move an object and so forth. So I found it, it, it was sort of a brain changer for me. And I think we often think too of how we don't want our students' skills to regress, but at the same time, I don't want my teacher skills to regress. And so I think it was a, it was a nice time for me, too, to, to do something uh, novel. One of the nice uh, things that happened almost by, by accident was that the kids wandered over to the book section. And if you live in Cape Elizabeth, you know that the swap shop has uh, books donated, and they're really nicely organized. So Caleb on the left up there found a book of um, a collection of the states with all sorts of trivia information. Um, Halima found uh, arts and crafts intact, not even used, you know, um, so uh, they were free. I told them they were free to bring them back um, to the classroom and to keep them if they wanted. And in the middle there, Caleb is holding um, a water bottle that we repurposed, and it was one of the key parts of our um, contraption, as it turned out. 
And then one of the first, prior to actually be building the contraption, we had uh, Melissa led a lesson in building um, levers and experimenting with fulcrums and, and where you place it. Some are easier than others. Um, uh, Antonio on the right there had a quite elaborate one with a, a skateboard that had been taken apart. And Halima there is uh, writing that was, uh, I think, most likely a focused writing about the lever that she had just uh, built. Um, another picture of a, a lever that was built, and that's Manasa. And Caleb, and I know, uh, see if he's not here, one of our students, um, Elliot was here, um, who, who's already left. They love taking part, uh, apart video cassettes. And uh, there were plenty of those up at the swap shop. We ended up using the containers for the um, cassettes as part of a domino effect. But at first we thought we might be using the innards of a, uh, a VHS. Cooperation and collaboration. Also, one of the byproducts of, of this classroom was the spirit of cooperation, I think, that developed over the four weeks, and uh, I think friendship and, and connection. We found that we had a, a, a class of readers that really enjoyed um, talking about the books that they had discovered at the swap shop, um, talking about other books, lending each other books. So that was, an, that was a nice uh, thing that uh, developed. And we also found at the swap shop, Mousetrap. And that, that was, uh, if you have many of you played it, or it was a part of your childhood. Um, so they put it together that they had to follow directions, you know, uh, so actually technical language, right? Uh, they had to put it together, then we played it, and we decided that that would be the end game of our contraption, that our domino effect would eventually uh, catch the mouse, and so that. Um, and I think one of the students went home with the mouse trap game to play with her siblings. Um, and this is the early part of the machine where a ball would be dropped down that uh, lever, uh, excuse me, ramp, and it would hit the water um, water bottle, the loaded water bottle. It had sand and water in it, so that would uh, actually fall down, bringing down the screen and so forth. This was another feature of it. We had. <laughs> uh, probably too much time to explain, but anyway. <laughs> and our, our last uh, day, we, uh, again, we're so close to so many uh, wonderful places. Um, I got in the school van and we, uh, drove our little group to Fort Williams, and it happened to be just before the Beach to Beacon, so the, the uh, park was crowded with many people touring it. And uh, yeah, so it, I think that, that photo sort of captures the, f the fun we had, and um, you know, it was learning, but it, it wasn't onerous. And it, as a teacher, it, it seemed to really go by fast. So we have a 30-second video, the last day of the uh, class. Actually, we did it twice. We had it run twice, on a Wednesday and then a Thursday. For the Thursday performance, we had about 30 people in the classroom, I think, all from kindergarten up through our own students. We had our students explain the contraption, and we also had a, a third going into fourth grader. You can kind of see him. He's on the right bottom side, Murtada. He, he helped out a lot in imagining what we could do with the, the contraption. Okay, so here goes. I wish we had music. Let me go ahead and make sure it's up. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think you do have some of the writing journals that they kept. I told them when they wrote in these that they were public, that we were sharing, so there's nothing that is. I just wanted to say that particular morning, they had had great success the previous day, and it took multiple days, <laughs> probably nine to ten that morning. Anxiety was in to work building. Perfectly, but you could feel everyone in that room holding their collective breath to let out that tear at the oh. end. It was a very exciting moment for 
kindergarten through high school. Yes, yeah. And adults in the room. Yeah. Any other questions? Are there any questions? Thank you, Lisa. I'm just curious, what, um, as a teacher, what you, what you take away from the experience in terms of uh, uh, this approach to learning and how you might find ways to, to put it in, into practice in your classroom, or, or maybe not. <laughs> but, you know, I think, it, as I mentioned, it really built a spirit of cooperation. And we had an afternoon for about an hour where they played board games, I think Pictionary, for instance, and Mousetrap. And you might think, oh, that's, uh, that doesn't belong in a classroom. But having that moment where they are cooperating and learning to take turns and uh, to speak to one another and break down barriers, uh, perhaps, of, you know, who are you? I don't know you. I don't need to know you. That was something that I took away. Like, it's really important to build that in an English classroom. I think, and maybe that's one place it can happen. The other thing is I think it opens up m many possibilities for me for more cross-discipline um, teaching. Th that I think it's extremely um, invigorating to me to work with a math teacher, for instance. And I might have my own feelings of intimidation, like that's not my area. But if, you have, if you're teamed up with the right person style-wise, um, those concerns seem to drop away and you find yourself, I find myself making a few math comments and she jumps in with a journal idea and it, it cross-pollinates that way. So, yeah, I think it could have more potential. I think John mentioned it's like a lab, it was like a lab school this summer to, to have that opportunity. Thank you. Can I yeah. just offer one comment also? Um, since Lisa brought up the lab school and you've talked really well about the the students, but I've, I've spent my career um, teaching teachers and, and coaching and mentoring team teaching situations, and I, I don't think we should overlook the experience that these particular teachers had, Lisa, and, and, and uh, you know, we put students first, but we put students first, I think, by giving teachers rich opportunities to be engaged just as their students are. And this particular classroom this summer, so I've been around for Open Door Studios for, the, for last year and this year. Um, and you know, we called it Open Door Studios because we wanted to look at this learning environment as a, as a studio, as a place, you know, similar practices as laboratories. And to go into their classroom on any given day, because um, Lisa and Melissa were really the only ones that had full, a full-time collaborator all summer long. They, they had each other as partners. The other classrooms had me once in a while. But to go into this classroom on any given day, it was on fire. And in a 20-year career of doing this kind of work and observing this kind of work and writing about this kind of work, it's about as good as it gets. And it was a real studio setting, and the students were engaged, the teachers were engaged, watching them, watching your ears and Melissa's, you know, watching, you could see those neurons developing, <laughs> those neural paths and tunnels, right, on a teacher level. And I think that, I just want to make sure that we're, of course, we're doing this for the students, but I think that it's a very, very rich opportunity for teachers to develop their skills, like Lisa said, to want to, want to always want to up their skills. And I think it only happens through, through this opportunity to collaborate on a, on a full-time basis and to have that free reign. So um, thank you for supporting that. Um, yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, John. Yes. I just, just wanted to say that with this, the three days of professional development that were before, that really seemed to set the the pace or something different and like you said also mutually beneficial to the teachers and to the students and that's unique and thank you for stepping up to it to, right. to do it. Thank you. I agree. It, it, it was unique and I hope that can be replicated that future team teaching especially during the school year that that would be uh, really beneficial to have even an afternoon um, worked in but three days w was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I always love hearing about that. Okay. Up next, we have administrator strategic plan updates and lights. Yes. You're going to get a little steeper. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to shut up the projector, but um, tonight we're going to focus really on two areas. Um, the strategic plan, one is our K-12 curriculum work. Um, 
that has happened in the disciplines as well as teaching professional development that took place over the summer. So we thought that would be a great focus for this meeting following the close upon our summer work. And I don't know which administrator might like to me start. You want that? Yes. Oh, the journals. So I do want to say about the Smarter Balance thing, I know that's not why I'm standing up here, but there was one student in particular who took Smarter Balance as seriously as anybody has ever taken any test at Cape Elizabeth High School. She happens to be sitting right at the end right here. <laughs> <laughs> and Montana did experience the test. If anybody has any questions about it, she can tell you how seriously her peers took that test and how seriously they didn't take that test as well. So it was an interesting experience. Um, so really what I'm here to talk about, and I think each of the principals, just to highlight a few things that our teachers worked on this summer. Um, I will say that there's, I'm still gathering some information and, haven't, and I don't myself have a complete picture. I know what the proposals were and I saw teachers in and out a lot, but I, don't, I still have a lot of final reports to come in in terms of accomplishments and the work that was done. I do know one of the um, sort of most Notable in terms of curriculum revision were the math teachers getting together and talking about revisions to algebra and geometry to be more responsive both to the Common Core and to revisions in the SAT that are coming up and that are going to be unveiled. I think, I think the first new SAT test is in March, I think. So there are some bits and pieces of reorganizing and um, dropping some things and putting some things in uh, that are very much designed to sort of address both those common core and, and those changes as well. Um, there was lots of work in biology done by multiple teachers to move us more in the direction of a lab-driven course, approach to that course, at all levels from AP to CP. Um, that will absolutely be a work in progress over the next two to three years. There was a lot of work, I do have to say, um, every summer when we have new teacher hirings or new personnel joining us, one of the top priorities that I have for summer work is to make sure that those folks um, are feeling good, feeling well prepared, feeling well supported coming into the year. And in some cases, it's veteran teachers who are taking on new teaching assignments. So we have new teachers and veteran teachers teach, uh, taking on new teachers' assignments that um, were well supported through professional development and that was in any, everything from calculus to physics and chemistry and English um, to philosophy um, and a number of other things um, and there were some brand new courses that teachers were in the process of preparing and that's in physics and in philosophy in particular. Um, there was a lot of work done by a team of teachers both in math and English working together uh, uh, to get skillful in a program of assessment. It's an online program of assessment called IXL that's begun to have a foothold both in the middle school and high school. Um, I think the middle school is probably taking a lead on that to some extent and this year our English teachers are beginning to explore how they can use that program as well. The nice thing about it is it gives really instantaneous feedback to kids about how they're doing and how they're not doing and what their struggles are. Um, so that was a, a large area. One of the elements for the strategic, in the strategic plan is the development and publication of a uh, new coherent curriculum. Um, and so there was a lot of work in that, in essentially every, every curriculum area. Last year a major push was in part its anticipation of our NEAS visiting team coming in March and in part its anticipation of the, uh, in response to the strategic plan and in part it's a response to the emphasis on differentiation uh, which requires sort of first grounding yourself in what's in common and what those learning goals are. So there was a lot of work in really, I mean, every area, French, Spanish, math, English, social studies, I mean, everywhere. Um, and I'm feeling good about the work that was done. We're moving much more towards a common sort of approach to writing the things that we're writing and looking at common core looking at national standards and doing those sorts of things. So sort of at a very broad general level, and I do apologize, a lot of the information is still coming in to me and I expect um, within the next a couple weeks, certainly I'm talking with department chairs tomorrow about um, exactly where they are and getting in final reports and all that sort of stuff. But it is exciting to see the work that teachers undertake during the summertime. 
Are with, there any comments, kudos for the curriculum development at the high school? That's an enormous. And I would say work, and I'm sure Mike and Kelly will echo it, that's the kind of work that doesn't happen in every school district because not in every school district you get the kind of support from the board for this kind of work. Um, it makes an enormous, enormous difference. So thank you very much for the sustained commitment to professional development. It makes a large difference. I just had a real, real quick, if that's possible, Jeff. Thank you for that. It was really interesting. I'm curious and follow up to our math conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the um, algebra geometry, trying to look at Common Core and the impact on your current curriculum. I wondered a if if they're seeing major shift needs, and b if the teachers are still satisfied with their materials, their their support resources for those two subjects. Um, I don't sense any, any significant dissatisfaction. I do sense a need, and, and the math teachers have been sort of the leaders in, within the high school in terms of IXL and that sort of thing, it, sort of getting more grounded in, in actual measures of how students are doing. So they're very much beginning to use IXL. They're using AccuPlacer uh, yeah. pretty systematically to make sure that kids, when they graduate, are college ready, are, are, are ready to step in without having to take remedial courses. We're not perfect there, but we've come a long way. Uh, the major changes that I'm aware of, and this is only probably surface level, Barbara, but the major changes I'm aware of in, in, is looking at combining units in different ways from what they've done. And in particular, in anticipation of the SAT, there is um, some new material that's on the SAT, or is at least emphasized in a much deeper way than it has been in the past, particularly around statistics um, and data analysis and those sorts of things, and applying those skills to solving real problems, uh, which was one of the goals, actually, of the Smarter Balance test. But the Smarter Balance test almost, almost became a monster in terms of the way, the way it approached it. Um, so I hope that is somewhat responsive. I, I'm, I can, yep. Any other questions for? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the hard work. <clears throat> Principal Tracy wants us to go boy, girl, boy, girl, so I will do that. Um, before I go over our professional development and curriculum um, work that we did this summer, I um, just want to um, let you know we had a fabulous first day of school, as one of our parents mentioned, and we actually welcomed 59 new students over the summer. So as of today, we had our 59th new student. Um, so we're up to 573 students at Pond Coast. We're grateful for the extra two classrooms that, um, that the board approved and the superintendent recommended. So we're very happy about that. But we had a lot of happy faces um, and a lot of wilted um, children leaving um, at the end of the day and a, wilted, a lot of wilted staff as well. We're also really proud, as you know, of um, our third grade teacher, Talia Edlund, who is a, one of three finalists for Maine Teacher of the Year. And on September 30th, there will be a team coming and to do a site visit, and you'll learn more about that. Um, Talia, Meredith, and I will be developing a, a plan for the day, so um, stay tuned for that. So we're very enormously proud. Um, and we know that she represents good teaching of, of everybody at Pond Cove. Um, so for our professional development um, and curriculum work this summer, I'm not going to go through this pretty exhaustive list. We're, as, as Jeff said, you know, we're, we're really thrilled to have a district that supports the work that, that we're able to do. And so I have a handout for you. So don't worry, I'm not going to read it all. Don't worry. Um, but this will give you an overview. It's done, it's done chronologically. And I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights in terms of the content. Um, we have done, we did a lot of work. And what you'll see on here is you'll see the, the title, the content um, chronologically, along with all the staff members that participated. And I, I apologize for the small font. I tried to keep it on one page. Uh, my font's bigger. Uh, but we focused a lot on culture, school culture, classroom culture. And we had five staff members attend responsive classroom workshops um, at the start of the summer. 
And many of you are uh, familiar with responsive classroom. If you're not, it's really a pro-social model for building community in the classroom and in the, in the school and helping children understand taking responsibility and treating one another with respect. It feeds in very well with our peaceful pond code practices, but we see it as enhancing it even more. And it's also shifted some over the years, so it, it's, really, it's really grown even better as a model than we, we used to host it at Pond Cove years ago, and um, it's real, we're really happy that we had so many attend that are going to be sharing out. Uh, so our school counselor, Brie Gallagher, she developed a fabulous K-4 guidance curriculum roadmap. And this is going to be for her when she goes into her, all the K-4 classrooms to do her guidance lessons. And I was actually going to give you a huge packet of all these things, but Ruth Ellen um, advised me not to waste some entries. So you, if you want any more um, information, I have lots of information on all of these. Um, the instructional team leaders and our um, student support team members, we did a book study on a book called How to Create a Culture of Achievement in Your School and Classroom by Doug Fisher and Nancy Frey. And it focused on different five pillars on what helps make a community, what helps really build a school community. So we're focusing on that. On um, that, that's going to be part of our focus on our first half day um, when we have our first early release day in um, September. And we also did a second day of that work really planning out what those pillars are. And just to give you a sense about what I'm talking about when I say pillars, like pillar one is about welcome. How do we make people feel welcome? Both That's both students, parents, staff, visitors. Um, the next pillar is do no harm. How do we treat one another? Um, what do we what do we do that um, helps children be responsible and also helps us as adults make sure that uh, we're not we're being we're being appropriate as we're approaching them and helping them problem solve. The next one is choice words. How do, what are the words we use? Those are very very important. Um, and it's never too late to learn. And that's really about creating a structure and how we respond to things that come up unexpectedly. Um, putting in place structures for collaboration, reflection, self-assessment. And then the last pil pillar is called best school in the universe. Okay, How do we lift um, Pond Cove um, to make it even better and better? And those are things um, that we want to put in place for you know, really energizing the staff. Um, and I think you can see by the list here, they were pretty darn energized over the summer. And I, it was probably the most robust professional development I've seen in a long, long time um, of how much they wanted to do. It was really, really outstanding. The other area that I want to focus on is math. We did a lot of um, curriculum work in math. And um, one of the most exciting things was Meredith sent Ruth Ellen and I to train the trainer conference at the University of Chicago for the Everyday Math 4th edition. And, we were, it was fabulous, and I really think we felt like we could go to MIT and teach math, you know, when we were done with that. We were just so energized by it. But we, what we did on, and it's at, it's at the bottom, I believe, of that sheet, but um, we spent, Ruth Ellen and I spent two days working with grades one through four on get everything with units, um, lessons, assessments, everything. Uh, how to use digital, how to use multimedia components of it, but really help them understand about the content um, and how, it's, how it aligns to Common Core, helping them really understand what standards for mathematical practice are, that they are, it's K-12, and that, that the foundation starts in kindergarten, building up, and then also what the content standards are for each grade level and how that fits in. And so our teachers were really, really um, pleased, and we did exit slips, and they asked really good questions. Um, so it was really good work. Our kindergarten teachers who had already implemented, um, started in implemented the fourth edition of Everyday Math um, last year because it was ready. They did work themselves. And what they did, they discovered that they wanted to have more focus on um, Con content standards and also the practice standards so that they weren't so tethered to just the program. They really did some really thoughtful work on making sure that they, they had time to make sure the children went deeper with it. And um, one, one great thing that we um, learned about the fourth edition is it's actually, it goes deeper, but there are fewer lessons. And so it allows, there's a lot of, um, opportunities, there's a lot of lessons that are two-day lessons, open response lessons and re-engagement, and you know, a lot of opportunities for um, collaboration, much more so than before. We also had um, 
two teachers go to um, Professor, P Professor uh, Mahesh Sharma, who you've heard of before. Other teachers have attended his workshops, and um, on, this one was on the diagnosis and, and remediation of learning problems in math. He's done some great work um, with many of our special educators. And this, um, we also had people doing um, work on the, how, how we're going to lift this with the Common Core more and build, build a better understanding of it so that it, fit, it aligns well. And so we're excited. Our, our days, our early release days, what we've done is we've, we've really used, we're, our plan is to really use the bulk of them for math. The first one on September 22nd is going to be really based on climate and culture. If we have some time, um, we're gonna, we want to try to fit in some, some pieces of math into that as well. Um, but we really want it to focus around wrap around social emotional support for our vulnerable cohorts, um, continue our work on responsible digi digital citizenship. Uh, we're trying to build in technology into each of those components. Tom Chalter has asked if he could have time, which is understandable. We, we want to make sure that we're giving our teachers enough time for technology learning and not just making it just an offering, what we call Tech Tuesdays. If you're available, you can come. Uh, the second, uh, the second um, early release date is on November 16th, and um, Ruthellen and I were able to connect, um, oh, we had fabulous people there, um, but connect with um, a, a staff developer and teacher named Gina Kling, and she comes from Western uh, Michigan University. She also works with Kemsey, which is the Chicago Elementary Math and Science Education um, School at um, the University of Chicago. She's either going to come in person or we're going to Skype her in. And she does. She works on math fluency. She's coming. She's coming. She's coming. I heard her. She's coming. And um, she works on math um, fact fluency. And it's really some astounding work that um, research based. She's also written a lot for National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. So we're really delighted that we have her coming. Uh, also on December 7th, um, that's our third half day um, is we want to work on what's called open response and re-engagement lessons. And those are two-day lessons. So that's when you are giving children um, problem solving to do. And, and I think about what you did in Open Door Studio. It's you're, you're really letting them, uh, one thing we learned was we often try to rescue children. Too, like We try to jump in too quick to help them. And so that day one on these open response lessons is we let the children really explore and see how they can work collaboratively and problem solve on their own. And then the second day really is for the teachers to collaborate and you take a look at the data, take a look at what the, what the children have come up with for their problem solving, and then use that information on how they're going to plan to re-engage students th th for that next day so that they can help them see and help them find, okay, where did that break down, whether they use highlighters, whether they go and they, they, they go to, a, you know, work with another pair of uh, people that tried something, tried something different. So it's really powerful, really powerful stuff. We're very excited about it. We also want to use that day to do what are called progress check-in unit assessments. And um, every unit in everyday math is, has an end of the unit assessment. This, this edition has um, they're two-day assessments, and so there's like an end of the unit assessment, and then they have open response assessments, and they also have cumulative assessments. So it's, there's quite a bit of meat to it that will really inform us. Um, Tom Chalte did a survey at the end of the school year about what teachers wanted from technology, and so the biggest one was teaching, what, was, what they coined as teaching with technology in mind, and so what we want to do is embed that in that same day with helping them use technology to analyze student responses, um, to plan for the re-engagement and deeper understanding. And then March 7th is our fourth day um, of early release, and that's where one of um, our plan is to do um, K-4 math differentiation for our vulnerable cohorts and also for enrichment, students who require enrichment. And then obviously an analysis and progress monitoring of K-4 data walls, which would be you know, picture, you know, student data all up, both for math and literacy. And I don't want to give you the impression that we're only doing math this year, but we really know that, but we really want to really focus deeply on it. Um, and then also teaching with differentiated technology in mind using the Everyday Math Digital Suite. There's a, there's a whole digital um, suite um, tied to this. And then the last um, half day we have um, on May 16th, we really felt it was important to kind of, you know, 
take a step and see, do a checkpoint and make, see what's, what the teachers really need at that point. So our plan is um, right around parent conference time in March is to send out a survey, find out where we are, do we, you know, with pro between program evaluations and what teachers feel that they need. And then that's going to be determined based on that needs assessment on what teachers um, feel would be the best use of that time. And we also plan to give them team time um, that is specific to their grade levels during, during that time too, that, that ties in with what the focus is. So, any questions? No. Thank you so much uh, for uh, the plan on the half day uh, use of time. That's well, thank you for the half day use yeah. of time. So we're it's exciting, delighted. exciting stuff that you're so. doing there. I'm sorry. No, that's right. I, I thought that you were, we were moving on. I uh, no, no. Um, Any questions for Kelly? Thank you. I'd love a handout so that I can see um, what we're doing. Yep. Um, I know it must be amazing, to, uh, very difficult to find, uh, to decide out of all, all the amazing things that we can have focus a handout on. of the half days. Thank you. On all the things that we can focus on for those half days, um, who do you work with in the district? Is it just Ruth Allen? Is it the middle school? Um, is it Mike to decide um, needs. the needs? You know, so we've got, are we working down the curriculum from high school down to Conco? Are we working Conco up? Or are we looking at the needs of uh, the middle school and seeing what we missed and what we need to the, the, I think for the most part, as far as, far as like oh, map, culture, obviously, you know, we, we want to, we, that's an obvious one we want to kick off the year with. For math, because we're implementing um, the fourth edition, it's really important that our teachers really understand it. And particularly with it, it being tied to the Common Core, there really needs to be more, more depth given to, more time and depth given to teachers' understanding of what the Common Core really is, because there's, a, there's distinctions between the standards, and they really need to understand what the standards are, also how we measure them, and how we're going to differentiate, how we're going to, how we're going to monitor the progress, uh, how, how students meet the standards. So it's re this really is more upon co-focus. Now, with that said, we still want to be, you know, connecting to obviously fifth and sixth grade, and we have actually everyday math, the fourth edition has, we have actually the fourth and, uh, the fifth and sixth grade, we can see like where that goes, we have samples of that, and we, and we benefited from that when we went to the University of Chicago. So if that answers your question. So then you look over all of this to make sure that Mike's team is not doing something. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Six. And we do talk to each other. I know. I we just, do. You know. <laughs> we all sit down together. Yeah. Mm. Just because it's so exciting, I don't want to ask those uh, questions because I know you're all doing amazing work. But uh, um, to see how we get the fresh links, however, you know, it's all building. I just have to see. And you'll get, I mean, what I gave you today, the pink, the pink one is really a framework. I mean, so you'll get more detailed because obviously we want the input of staff too as, as they're going along and you know, it doesn't, you know, it, there could be a, you know, I, we left the last one is to be determined really because it is so far out and we don't know along the way there might be something like a hiccup like, whoa, we need, we need some more um, staff development on this particular item. So we didn't want to get so far ahead and have it, you know, be too rigid. At the same time, there might be something that we find out like from Gina Kling, our, our fact fluency person um, who comes in that we might need to do, you know, make some shifts in something else and add that to it. And also, again, we don't want to, you know, there's no intention of avoiding literacy because it seems it's very math heavy, but we wanted to really give a lot of focus to math um, in terms of professional development. So we do this. No, I was just going to respond, Kate, to your point to say, you know, it, it's a fair question because it's very easy in a district for things to get disjointed. And it takes effort and commitment to keep things aligned and for the right hand to know what the left hand is doing. Um, it's the reason the board, I believe, has supported having the position of a director of instruction. It's the reason that our administrative team meets um, to have conversations. And, and the reality is there are a lot of things pulling at every school, at every teacher, at every administrator, at every given time. So it, it, it's not perfect yet. 
uh, but there's been a lot of time and effort put into trying to get it right and to enhance the dialogue and conversation so that we are really having those conversations K-12, pre-K, yes. postgraduate, so really looking at the impact. And is it the same, the follow-up, is it the same for the social-emotional growth? So the work that Bree and Health is doing here is the same for Kim and the, the middle school work. Um, are we aligned social emotional as well? For example, we talked last year about the Stan Davis work and how it connected to the Steve Wessler work. Our guidance and social work staff meet together as well periodically to talk about their work. We have guidance lessons that are integrated into the classroom at the elementary building that continues into the middle school. That fades off at the high school where it becomes more of a student to teacher piece, but some of those pieces are augmented by the health curriculum in upper middle and in high school. So, yes. Thank you. And I just wanted to say for me, what's truly exciting is to hear that there's this integration K-12. When I came onto the board four and a half years ago, it was probably one of the most prominent hiccups in our system was sort of, you know, the punk did their thing, the school did their thing, the high school did their thing, and there was this cry for, I, from teachers that I heard, I really want to be able to work across, school, mm -hmm. across the campus. And we're doing it. To, you were doing it. And one of the things I wanted to add, too, is that when Gina Kling comes in, we're collaborating with Velma. Right. That's so, um, okay. because we had, one of the curriculum folks from Falmouth was in Chicago with us. We didn't know. We just kind of talked. Oh, hi. <laughs> so um, we're collaborating on that, sharing the resources. And so we'll have our teachers and some Falmouth folks together for that afternoon as well. So we That's great. kind of share the wealth and grow the network. It was great representation for me. And there's Falmouth, Cumberland, RSU, York, and us. Yeah, and so we all connected and, you know, we really are looking forward to, you know, doing some PLC work together and we're going to start with Falmouth um, and uh, go from there, you know, build an empire. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the color-coded. <laughs> Good evening. I nice to see you all. Echo. Many of the things that were great the first day, it's nice to see you all and welcome back. And it sure was hot um, and all those things. I don't have color-coded handouts like my colleagues, so sorry, I mean, really like them, but I would, it's an elementary thing. Oh, well, okay. Um, but I, it is exciting to certainly hear about all this amazing work and I, I think it clearly does two things. I think it corrects that mistaken notion that teachers have the summers off. <laughs> And I think it speaks to just how complex this work is uh, in terms of teaching and learning, that all of this time and energy and effort um, is spent over the summer to, to make these things happen. So um, I think you'll hear common themes both within the middle school um, in the proposals that I talk about, but also across the schools, which I think is very um, energizing and very um, exciting because it really speaks to the fact, like you, like you were all just saying, that we are all really rowing in the same direction, both within the middle school and, and across the district. So, so you'll hear some of these the same common themes, and I, I think um, the proposals that we got, I think, were just so focused and systematic and prioritized that um, you know it's very difficult to say no, and I, I can proudly say very little, uh, very few times that we had to say no through the board support, supporting Meredith to support Ruth Ellen to be able to support me to say yes, go for it, um, certainly is, is a great way to promote and, and support teachers and encourage them and, and very rarely do we have to say uh, not yet but, but try again and I have to say Ruth Ellen was extremely supportive and resourceful um, both with uh, local support but also with some, some grant opportunities so she was very helpful to, to our work. Um, so some themes uh, that you'll hear, we did have some teachers who got together to begin conversations about the process of standards-based grading, um, and in very general terms, looking at how do you go about aligning curriculum, creating skill charts, assessments, tracking systems, and grading translations that would, would go to their content areas. Uh, and that particular group is very interested in being um, a kind of a support group to their other teachers as we navigate piloting the proficiency-based grading and reporting practices. So um, that's very much on many people's mind and it's great to have a group of people within the building who are ready to, to take charge and, and lead that work. 
Um, we had some science uh, proposals and some work that went on. Sixth and seventh grade science teachers um, proposed developing curriculum maps uh, aligned to the next gen science standards. Um, they were assessing existing learning activities and looking for alignment to those standards, creating common assessments, developing a curriculum calendar, outlining scope and sequence for the year, um, and identifying gaps where new learning activities needed to be, to be built in to make sure that um, we're, we're implementing a curriculum that is, is aligned and gives students access and opportunity um, for the standards. Eighth grade science also spent time aligning to the next gen science standards. They were designing units um, aligned to those standards and looking at some changes to the middle school science progression. Some units have shifted to different grades, so they spent some time talking a little bit about what is it we expect eighth grade students to know and be able to do in terms of science. Um, they wanted to look at creating some projects and assessments and reviewing resources that could be used to be sure that they're supporting standards. Um, again, with this proposal, there was an eye toward looking at the standards-based benchmarks and language to use um, to be able to report out to students and families. We had some writing workshop uh, work that went on in units of study around the work of Lucy Calkins. Um, and it was open to all middle school language arts teachers and 11 of them came forward and convened for, for a day. And they looked at the general uh, writing workshop structure and they considered first, they started looking at what's necessary for the management and execution of a successful writing workshop, um, which I think is a great place to start. They shared ideas, discussed writing units, and then discussed applications of writing workshop and how that would fit in with grading and reporting in a standards-based manner. Um, and they completed some individual and grade level unit planning in the afternoon. We had a lot of math work also that went on, like, like other schools. Um, our teachers are um, going through a, a resource review um, process. They're really looking at the standards again and deciding what's going to best position us to give students uh, access and opportunity to those standards. So grade five spent some time reviewing math materials and samples that we were able to get with Ruth Allen's help. Uh, so they started looking through their standards and what resources were available. Grade seven and eight math teachers met together and identified common core standards that were common both to their classes and across grade levels for people who teach uh, to the same standards. There was a lot of work refining pre-algebra, algebra, geometry courses um, using the common core as a guide for sequencing, developing assessments, and reporting of the skills um, required for seventh and eighth grade math students. Um, a lot of common assessment work, both formative and summative, um, so that they could ensure that students uh, uh, know, knew and were able to, to do what was intended. Um, they were collecting, organizing a variety of resources that teachers could use to make sure standards were covered. Um, they, were, again, were looking at standards-based benchmarks and language that could be used in reporting out to students and to families, um, looking at common assessments they could use during the year with um, all the algebra classes. They were creating lists, resource lists of students so that they could have them create an interactive math notebook for the year. Um, and the outlined standards based grading plan for the geometry curriculum. And there was some proposal and discussion about making sure that we're well coordinated with the high school, both in terms of our algebra, algebra excuse me, and geometry classes. And uh, we've been in, in conversations about that. Uh, social studies work, seventh and eighth grade teachers got together. They're continuing mapping and aligning of, of common core standards. They developed assessments and were working on aligning uh, their first trimester, um, working on those assessments for social studies with also an eye towards how can we link social studies standards to the English language arts. So looking at some um, cross curricular opportunities. Um, seventh grade social study was, was creating units around the understanding by design model or UBD which really focuses around essential questions and developing common assessments. Um, one question I pulled out just to give you an example, one of the essential questions was what kind of person would you choose to help you govern a country? And I thought that would be a real uh, entry point for some meaty conversation about what you look for in, in leaders. They were very interested in looking uh, at a focus, uh, at focus standards, sometimes they're also called power standards or priority standards that they could focus on around each unit. 
and they wanted to have those target standards in place um, before the year began so that they could um, begin some of that work piloting proficiency-based grading and, and reporting, and seventh grade seems particularly eager to, to get at that, so we're going to support, support them in, in that work. Right at the end of the summer, Noel, Noel Haroff um, got together a group to talk about digital citizenship work and, and curriculum that can happen both through health and school counselors and across, across the school. There was a coding uh, workshop and group of people to, like, to get together to talk about how we can work with students um, doing coding, which, which was great. Um, our Last Wednesday, we had a half day where we had Steve Wessler come back and work with our staff, and he did an amazing, as always, powerful uh, exercise and, and series of discussions with our staff, preparing us for supporting healthy climate and culture. How do we help students stand up and speak up against issues of harassment, bullying, teasing, bias, uh, and all of that? And he just really gave us some, some effective you know, ways to, to help students and to intervene with students in a, in a way that preserves everyone's dignity and gives them the tools to move forward and do it themselves. So it, it was fantastic. So those are some highlights uh, and overview. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the, uh, all your updates. They're, um, they're busy. You guys have been very busy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item 5D, superintendent. So you just heard so a lot. You, um, you just heard a lot of information, so I'm going to try to keep this relatively concise. Timing myself. Three minutes. Um, as you know, it was our opening day for students, and the first thing I want to share with you is our first day enrollment. Again, this is not our official state enrollment information, but this is the information that we have as of today based on students in seats in schools. Um, at Pond Cove, we have 573 students. At the end of last spring, we had projected we would be around 547, so that's 26 students more than projected, and as the board is aware, um, as a result of the increased enrollment at Pond Cove, we hired two additional teachers using our contingency funds, using two-thirds of our contingency funds um, for grades K and 4. So that we could maintain class sizes. At the middle school, we have 522 students. We had projected 517, so we're within five students of our projection. At the high school, we have 541 students as of today, and we had projected 545. So again, we're four students within our projection. Um, I mentioned contingency funds, and I'm going to reiterate that. We are on September 8th. We have $75,000 remaining in a $26 million school budget. Um, it's not a lot of room within which to operate, so we're going to be monitoring finances carefully, and you'll hear about that at, certainly at our workshop um, later in September. But, right out of the gate. Um, yeah, it's certainly a, a challenging place to start a fiscal year, um, but we are up to the challenge. Um, certainly, we'll keep you informed. Let's see. So to get ready for the opening of school, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. You obviously will be getting updates, further updates about all the work that took place in our facilities department, but there were extensive pieces of work, including um, power upgrades, as you're aware, at the middle school and at the high school ultimately, but it impacted Pond Cove in the middle school as well because of where the cable was run, and upgrades from Scott Dyer Road to the middle school um, Pond Cove complex. That resulted in power outages as late as last week, and in fact over the weekend, um, which, <laughs> which, as you can imagine, at a time when teachers are gearing up for the start of school is tricky. Um, it's tricky for teachers, it's tricky for our custodial and maintenance staff who are working at every waking hour um, to make sure that floors are scrubbed and cleaned and waxed and polished and uh, working against humidity that prevents floors from drying for our technology department who had to deal with not only having technology ready to be in student hands on day one, but making sure that all the teachers, including new teachers, had devices that they needed, and working with server shutdowns um, and the impacts of power failure for their work as well. So 
I, I just want to appreciate the work that all of those folks have done and the patience that everyone showed. And Lisa mentioned earlier, Lisa Melanson mentioned earlier, the spirit of collaboration and cooperation. We certainly tested some of that in the last couple of weeks. So again, I want to thank everyone uh, for their collaborative work to try to problem solve through some of these issues and, and keep a positive attitude. Um, with the number of construction projects that we had going on, including roofing replacement and HVAC work and the electrical upgrades, there were a lot of moving pieces. But I think uh, walking through the schools today, you would not know that any of that had happened. Um, and that, I think, is a testament to the work of everybody involved. So thank you. We recognized at our opening day um, for staff last week, and we have 183 teacher days in our calendar. 175 of those are when students are directly in front of those <laughs> um, teachers. So we have very limited staff PD time. Three of those days, and four actually at the high school level, occur after school. So we have only <laughs> three to four days where we have our K-12 teachers available to work on the same schedule. Um, across schools. Three of them for our K-8 teachers happened last week. One of those days was devoted entirely to work on our teacher evaluation system. Due to power challenges and um, some of the construction timing and contractor timing, um, you heard the middle school talk about the work that it did with Steve Wessler. Pong Cove was scheduled to do some additional work with staff overall on behavior. Um, that didn't happen for regular ed staff. There was a day at the beginning of uh, last week where we had an additional day where we brought in our special educators, K-12, to do some additional work around behavior management and providing positive supports for behavior and interventions. <coughs> and then our high school teachers, who only had two days last week, spent one of those days also working on our teacher evaluation model. And they spent the second day working on building level work. And again, in all of our schools, uh, we have work to do that's required, trainings that are required for all staff. For example, suicide prevention was a new training this year at the elementary school. That's an hour, minimum of an hour long training. Um, we have additional things that we, re we update staff on every year, including policies and procedures. We have very limited work time um, with those folks. So, this work that you hear about, the fact that we have those summer days available is hugely helpful and then we do our best to maximize our use of our staff meeting time, our faculty meeting times, our team meeting times in those other windows that we have available. But there's a lot to fit into a very small window and so if you're hearing this theme it's because you probably will hear us talk more about professional development needs and teacher time needs as we move into the upcoming budget because the pressures have not lessened. Um, so just putting that out there now. Be warned. Um, one piece that you heard um, from parents about at the beginning of the meeting, and this is information that the board has had and was shared um, with certainly the interview committee, is that we hired an interim special education director, as was the case when we hired an interim business administrator a couple of years ago. Um, the search committee had been able to find a successful candidate for that position, and we made the decision to move forward on an interim basis as the time moved forward. Um, that becomes ultimately my responsibility to seek out and vet candidates for that position. We found a candidate uh, who I believe to be the strongest possible candidate for that position. Um, that candidate is going to be working with us Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, so it is a part-time piece at this juncture. Um, our administrative team, I think, is going to do its best to sort of rise to that challenge. We know that it will not be perhaps perfect. Um, and that there will be some challenges for us in terms of meeting all of the scheduling pieces particularly, but um, we have good open communication with our interim special ed director and with one another so that we can make sure we're doing our best to cover those pieces. Um, a broader news uh, release will be going out this week so that all families are apprised of um, Mr. Floyd's contact information, phone, email, all of which have, again, due to our technology constraints, only been set up in the last few days. Um, our elementary assistant principal, Julie Nickerson, um, announced, again, as the board has heard last week, that she had accepted a principalship position in Freeport. So we're very excited for her, but her last day at Pond Cove will be this Friday. So um, Kelly and I have been in communication about looking at options to fill that position at Pond Cove, and, and Kelly will be working with staff there to look at sort of the best way forward. Um, and we'll keep you apprised of that. We have... Skipping down, our new business manager, Kathy Mesmer, started today. 
So she will be with us for your September workshop, but this was her first day in district, so she is getting up to speed on all of the business functions and budget and town, for, again, for both town and school. Um, and Paulina Portria, who was our interim business administrator and former business administrator, will be working with Kathy to make sure that she is ready um, for the challenges that she will face in her role. Um, but she, she's feeling up to the challenge. Let's see. I think we've hit most of the other highlights. I will just say one piece walking around today. Um, I, I got to see lots of students and lots of exciting faces and some wilted faces, first graders, particularly after recess, with very red faces and looking <laughs> kind of worn out, and certainly some seventh and eighth graders who had, um, had, <laughs> had been a little worn down over the course of the day. Um, but. But I also get to see some great things. John Holder, too, is here earlier as our extended learning opportunity uh, coordinator and volunteer coordinator was meeting with students about uh, projects that they're working on to include um, playwriting and interning as a math teacher and a number of exciting pieces. I saw students, and again, I walked Kathy and Steve around. I, my own visits, and then I walked Kathy and Steve around later in the day, so I got a couple rounds through. Um, every school, but I, I saw nobody crying, <laughs> which is always a good sign on Bonus. the first day of school. Um, and overall, I saw really enthusiastic conversation, greetings, smiles, and, and it felt like a good place to be today. So again, we look forward to a good school year. Very exciting. Um, I just wanted to get back, because we had comments from the public on the interim special ed director position. I also served on that committee, and I, I know that there was um, uh, some frustration that the committee had, well, it's, it's a very niche position to fill. So the, the pool to choose from is very shallow. And we had some candidates that just didn't rise to the committee's liking and didn't really pass on to the final selection process. And then to reopen it again, I believe we had what, one or two applicants. Um, I know that um, having a, a part-time is, is going in the other direction than what we had promised in the previous spring, but it is not for lack of effort or for lack of recognition of the need. Um, I do know that I, I, I feel like I speak for the board that we realized that there was, um, we heard you loud and clear, and we haven't abandoned the promise, and we will continue in earnest to try and fill that position. John? If I could just add to that, it's not the first time that we've, we've struggled to fill administrative positions and other positions as well in the district. Um, uh, our superintendent has stepped in to be the business manager at one point, to be the assistant principal at the middle school uh, to, to, um, to, to work in, in special education directly. Um, uh, Meredith, you've played many roles um, and, and um, when we've had roles to fill and, and, um, and uh, I appreciate the effort of everybody who was involved in the, in the search and, and I think that um, it's important at times when a search doesn't um, produce the candidate that we're looking for to, to, to keep looking um, rather than to fill the position with whomever may be available um, uh, and because um, these, these positions are so critical. So um, I, I appreciate what you said, Joe, in terms of um, you know, the board's commitment to, to finding a full-time person. And, and the I appreciate, right. Meredith, the work I know you will do to help uh, fill in um, for, um, you know, for having an interim and a part-time part person in that spot. I, I believe we have in front of us the living example in Meredith of why waiting for the right person to come along. We had an interim superintendent for a year because the search just didn't produce what we were looking for for our district to move the district forward in the direction that we desired and meet the needs that we had at the time. And, um, compromising just to fill the position would feel strongly against doing anything yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I would like to add too that I, 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 I share the concern about the part-time. We talked about it in the spring and it, and it was really kind of a surprise to me that we landed there. So I do wish that had been vetted a little more 
uh, at the board level when we landed on that decision. So I would just like to say I was a little disappointed about that. And I've searched in my minutes and can't find that we ever talked about it. So um, I was just a bit surprised too. So I'm glad that we'll continue to look, continue the search, and uh, and perhaps our interim person will give us more time if it appears really clear that it's stressing the system. Um, I actually do recall the proposal coming through in the budget process and bidding that out with Meredith at a workshop, making it a part-time position and, and divvying out the other responsibilities to some other administrative right, right. positions at the time. Yeah. Um, but again, we heard the concerns from the community and we've been responsive, or as best we can, to those needs. Can I just ask for um, a clarification of the process from this point forward? You know, um, is the Still for applicants to still come in and at what point with the previous committee? Will they still meet as a committee? Just, just for the sake of committee members, sure. uh, what to expect? The committee members received that information last week, but we the posting that had was active through about two weeks ago um, was removed last week. So I guess it was active through the beginning of last week, but that posting was removed. Um, it is my opinion that we are unlikely to find the candidate in the next couple of months um, based on the fact that the position was open for multiple months and we didn't find a suitable candidate. So the anticipation would be that we would post the position for early winter, likely December, um, and pull together an interview committee which might consist of the same people. It might be different and new people. Um, people certainly would need to decide and look at the time commitments involved to hire a candidate moving forward. And that's the same process that we followed when we reopened our business administrator search and the same process that we followed when we reopened our middle school um, principal search. So it's, it's, it doesn't behoove us, it sounds like, to leave the posting out there through this period of time. I think people need to know that there is a point person that they can contact and feel comfortable that their needs and requests will be addressed. No, I mean, I, I think so too. I just, since it's interim, I, I guess it just uses mm -hmm. me a little bit. Dave? I've heard a lot of talk about this, but it seems to me it's fairly self evident what has occurred, but I kind of like confirmation of that. We agreed to have a full time position. There was some debate about whether or not we should. Um, I thought it was appropriate to have part time, but we agreed on full. We searched for a full time person for a large, a number of months, we're unable to find that. We can all be disappointed in that, but that's life. I wish I could get up every morning and get everything I want, but you can't get it. So the only person we felt was qualified was only willing to work the three days a week. Is that essentially correct? Yes. So we ended up with a part-time person, not because we changed our mind, not because you changed the criteria, but because the job market was such that it dictated the result that we had. Is that fair? Okay, so we have a qualified person who can only get them to work part-time. We'll try to get a full-time person. Maybe we convince this person to work full-time, but right now this is the best we could do. And we don't control the job market. Is that essentially right? Yes, David. Thank you. So just in terms of timeline, um, you know, given school starting now, and if you're a qualified special ed director, you're probably already employed so the window would be in the winter when people start to look um, you know ending up this current year to maybe make a job change it would be for next year just in terms of hiring expectations so at some point in January we'll be reconvening an interview search committee and, and posting to fulfill the job hopefully they could start this year but more likely than not it would be for for next year that's accurate Thank you, Michael. Thank you for your report. Um, item number six, new business at 10 of 9. Uh, we've had a good meeting so far. Tons of good information. Uh, may I have Yes, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, I move that we approve the following job descriptions uh, as listed in the board packet under item 6A. Discussion. I noticed that there's a number of positions that have been 
um, updated despite the fact that there hasn't necessarily been a transition in that position? So have these position descriptions been updated in response to um, position reviews? Or? Yes. Yes, okay. and Bo uh, both. both. In some cases, they were open positions, and um, in the other cases, they were just part of the review process. Perfect. I have a question there. Mm -hmm. um, what about putting in all job descriptions um, and requirement is uh, and, uh, reading, understanding, following uh, board policy when you're coming into, you know, it would seem like that would be not a, a learning on the job, but a, a, prerequ a prerequisite. So we actually have a policy that says employees will follow policy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so it, it yes, Thank we put you. it there rather than in each individual job description. Thank you. David. Um, I have a couple of substantive suggestions to the job descriptions because job descriptions tend to be both the type of person you want and also what their, their skill set should be and they get graded against their skill set in the job description, I assume, among other things. And to me, um, the only two I have any knowledge worth uh, talking about would be the assistant principal for the high school and, um, and it's probably too late, but this school department business manager and municipal controller. The, on that one, it seems to me that um, we say under special knowledge and skills, experience in both school and municipal finance, financial accounting practices, I would want to change that word experience to proficiency. I mean, the fact you have some experience doesn't seem to be to be adequate. One thing I've noticed with the loss of Pauline is how much she knew and was capable at doing all these things. So I would change the word from experience to proficiency, because experience could mean you've had one day experience, you could have had four months experience. You want somebody to be good at it. And the other thing I would add to it would be, because we run into this a lot, proficiency in applicable federal, uh, state, and local funding requirements and financial reporting. I see both those points sort of mentioned in the last bullet points, but it seems to me it should be up in the knowledge and skill set. This, these are suggestions, okay? Um, a more broad ranging but narrow uh, is under the assistant principal. Um, on the performance responsibilities, it, it lists a variety of things, and this goes to more of a philosophical view. I think an assistant principal should be the equivalent of a principal, but assist the principal in doing all of their functions. Whereas I think princip assistant principals, at least at the high school, tend to be more oriented towards student uh, discipline. Uh, student culture, I think an assistant principal should be capable of performing all the functions of a principal, which would be, and a lot of emphasis on teacher evaluation, staff evaluation, academics, curriculum, and so forth. So I think that's what a more modern view of what an assistant principal is. And the way this is, is described, and maybe it's, it, it talks about the assistant principal sort of having those functions if designated by the principal or if designated by the superintendent. I think it should be more upfront under assist the principal with general school needs as evidence in is to me not strong enough. It should be assist the principal in the performance of all of the responsibilities of the principal, including but not limited to these functions. Because I think that that's my view. And based on what I think an assistant principal should be, they should be as qualified as the principal. After all, they step into the if the principal's not there, they have to do it. And quite frankly, principals in all three schools have a ton of responsibility to be able to divide it up with somebody relatively equally skilled, but maybe not as experienced, would be a good thing to have. So that's what I'm, my suggestion is on that. So the board needs to decide whether or not it wishes to approve some, make these amendments. Well, so the question I would have in regards to that process is the suggestions for the updates to the current position descriptions have come through not only the building administrators but also the employees in the review for themselves as well as with you. Is that Yes, fair I mean the, the changes that were made to these job descriptions 
or that particular one, the high school assistant principal were relatively minor. They re reflect an update in the building administrator certification um, requirements as well as um, the, an additional paragraph to, at the end of the policy that we have added to policies as we have made changes over time. But yes, building administrators and or relevant staff participated in the changes, modifications to the job descriptions and they were submitted to us. I'm of the mind that I, I believe David's suggestions are sound, but whether it is worthy to uphold the proving those job descriptions at this juncture and you know, maybe saving those comments for future record if they're applicable. That's certainly an option. Yeah, I, that is an option. Could, the person who made the motion could decide whether or not. Yeah, well, I, don't, um, I mean, these job descriptions are, you know, the board is approving these job descriptions. So um, if, you know, I think some of David's comments, I, you know, it, there's not a necessity to have these approved tonight, um, I imagine. So why don't we uh, remove the two David reference, high school assistant principal, school board department manager. David could forward his comments um, and edits, and then at the next meeting we could um, approve those. There's no reason we have to approve these tonight. I imagine the high school principal will still be at work tomorrow. Um, we hope so. So I move. I'll, uh, I'm not sure the board mumbo jumbo talk for this, but I will uh, start over. I will delete my prior motion, amend it. What's a legal word I need to put in there, David? Table. Table. I will table my motion, and I will come up with a new one. I move that we approve the following job descriptions. Ed Tech 1 Library, Ed Tech 1, High School Freshman Transition Coordinator, uh, Confidential Secretary, Central Office. Second. I second. So the discussion then would be to table the high school assistant principal and the school department business manager until yeah. having a, okay. I guess I have one more uh, question. Is the term uh, timeout still appropriate with the EdTech one? Um, it's on, uh, on page four. two, section four in their classroom. Um, is there further discussion on the amended motion by Mr. Moore? So if I ask for um, a show of hands, we're all solid on what words we're voting on? Okay. Yes. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6B, may I have a motion? I move that we approve the following athletic staff nominations. Middle school, Daniel Weeks, soccer, boys, grade 7, Matt Whaley, cross country girls, 7, 8, high school, Maura Myers, field hockey, varsity coach, and high school, Chris Whitney, golf, varsity coach. Second. Discussion? I'd just like to thank all the um, teachers and uh, staff people who step up to do this work. It's, um, it's a, a commitment. I know it's not much pay, so it's really an act of love um, and community builder. Thank you. Any other comments? David? I just want to add, like I usually do, to get to this point, it's not a simple robotic okay on our part. There were people, there were committees that reviewed these people, they hit like, on these sports ones, they're all uh, reviewed by the athletic director and the principals of the various schools, and uh, Marius looked at it. We looked at some data in, in, uh, in I want to say in camera, but in our, in our business meeting, uh, I mean in our executive session, excuse me. Um, so we did look at, substantively at, at these items, and we're sat I'm satisfied that they meet the criteria. Any further discussion? 
I would, just, I would just like to echo what Kate said. I really appreciate, especially with really busy teachers who know our kids, step up into these leadership coaching positions. I also extend my gratitude. All those in favor? Okay. Item 6C, would the policy chair like to review? Uh, so policies for first read this month include EHB, school records retention, and JJH, interrupted study. The changes um, to those two policies are in your packets, and they're fairly minor. Um, and then uh, the, the policy JJB, um, school-sponsored social activities and events, the, the policy committee uh, briefly um, suffered some summer slump um, in discussing this policy and and um, and uh, we were uncertain as to which what policy replaces the um, the, co the concepts that were covered by this particular policy um, and couldn't recall the the dialogue from the previous meeting. Um, so we will address that in our, having confessed that now publicly, <laughs> we'll address it in our policy meeting, um, which is to be scheduled. Um, and uh, that may come up for second read, and it may not, uh, depending on the outcome of that. Meeting. So although it's listed on our agenda as recommended for deletion, it's actually it remains recommended for deletion, but we'll, the committee is going to have to do some work to remind itself where it stood on that recommendation. So I do know that that particular policy, given previous bans on school dances and, and whatnot, um, I'm assuming that those types of activities are covered under other policies if we're recommending. Well, that, those are the. That's types of questions. That's the, the, in essence the question we're saying need, we need to address. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, the other part of that assumption is um, that our, our student representatives um, might be in the in the know on, or in the loop on reviewing either that particular policy or where those types of activities are covered under our school policies? We, whenever we feel that you know, student input would be valuable, we, we very much appreciate the, um, the participation of our student representatives. Um, Mr. Shedd, I saw you flinch. Was there? I, I, I can recap, which essentially was that we felt this was largely procedural and is already covered through school handbooks at each building level. Um, but we're happy okay. to revisit that conversation at the next policy meeting. Thank you. That's it. We don't need a, a vote on this item tonight. So we're putting these out for first read so that the public has a chance to you know, read and, and respond to either the suggestions um, or, or other comments that they may have on these policies. If they had any feedback, would that feedback go to both They can contact there? either the board chair, the superintendent, or the policy And is there a deadline chair. for that comment? Um, it would be, we would like to have comments a week before our next meeting, which is not yet scheduled. OK. But when we get to future meetings, I'll talk about that. Thank you. Um, item number seven, committee reports. Uh, the teacher evaluation committee is meeting, as Meredith reported, um, Thursday. Uh, we, they had uh, training with it, with uh, training, thank you. And then Thursday and next Wednesday to meet again uh, to do some work on the principal evaluation some lingering questions. Any other committees? I know it's kind of soon. We probably haven't adjourned any other committees to this point. Okay. 
Um, item number eight, school board agenda request for future meetings. Do I hear if there are requests for future school board uh, meetings, maybe from those of you watching at home, um, I would certainly email myself and or Superintendent Meredith Nato within two weeks so we could get those vetted and on the agenda and posted for public consumption. Um, item nine, announcements of upcoming meetings. Again, it's probably a little early just yet. Is there I just want to point out that the board's workshop this month will be held on Monday, the 21st of September, because Tuesday, the 22nd, is the beginning of Yom Kippur. What's the workshop on? I did. Yes. I believe we are, are continuing some conversation about professional development and curriculum work. That was intended to focus on sort of upcoming professional development and curriculum work and uh, school attendance. And we're going to do the uh, um, update on the buildings and grounds. Um, fortunately, the schedule allowed us to start later, which had, was, was a, uh, favorable given all the work that was done. But as I had promised, we're going to have an update on community services, the facility study that was funded by the town council, as well as an update on um, all the substantial roof uh, and capital improvement projects. So that will be available at the meeting on 921. Michael, will that facility study include the study of the pool that was done? It really was an engineering. Or it, well, yeah, engineering pool pool asset study. I mean, technically, they're facilities, so it's an engineering study done. An engineering study done for the pool. Yep. Okay. Oh, so the, certainly an important asset. So and policy has not yet scheduled. A meeting, but we have um, we, we would put forward the third Monday of the month for the fall meetings um, at either 7:30 a.m. or 3 p.m. or some other appropriate afternoon hour, um, based on the availability of the administrators who typically attend. We will conference and report back to you. Thank you. In short order. Um, I do know that um, one of the agenda items um, that goes for next month's agenda is also tied into future uh, meeting, which would be for the bottle shed. There's going to be a community-led bottle shed committee um, deciding how to distribute the proceeds that are now being collected to the bottle shed the bottle shed is now being monitored by staff at the recycling center as opposed to booster groups and volunteer groups taking it over once a month and um, then having that month's worth of proceeds. Instead, there's going to be a, just a collective committee deciding at least once or twice a year on how to distribute the funds that have been collected to the bottle shed. It's my understanding to this point, um, since the new management of the bottle shed has been taken over, there's about $12,000 to be redistributed and they're anticipating another twelve. dollars um, within the next three or four months. So I believe we have um, a community member um, who has stepped up from the school community to be a member of that committee. Um, and so next month we will make the announcement of who that is and um, vote them on to that committee. If you have any further questions about that committee, I'm happy to um, field your emails. I have a question of Michael. Um, when you say engineering, have they um, taken a look at the, the air quality and exchange in the pool? When you say engineering, are they looking at the air quality and what we might have to do for that? I cannot answer that question, but I will, uh, I don't know, I'll have, to, I'll have to find out. The reason I ask it is that it seems to be a hot topic, not, not to make a pun out of it, but seeing the pool all, all summer long with doors open and fans, and not being able, still not being able to breathe the air, I thought, I'm just curious. Yeah, I'd have, I don't know, I'd have to find out. Are there any other announcements of upcoming meetings? I have a motion. I hope that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much.